Hello and welcome to the ninth episode of season four of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Tuesday the 21st of June 2011 and in this episode we're going to discuss accessibility and talk to Barnaby Edwards about textbook stuff. We will of course cover the latest news, events, a bit about Ubuntu, command line love and go over your feedback. I'm Laura and with me this week are Alan, Tony Hello. and Tony Hello. <laughs> and Alan. Uh, and that's Alan Bell, because we don't have a Mark this week. Yes, I'm the re- replacement stunt double for Mark. <laughs> stunt Mark. You haven't got enough hair. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say the same thing. <laughs> a good replacement stunt double for Mark. So, Alan Pope. Hello. What have you been doing this week? I've been playing with my micro server. You know that little HP box that I got quite cheap a little while ago? Yeah. Mm. I've been putting more disk in it and playing with RAID and stuff. And I've had some performance issues because it's doing backups. And I asked on askubuntu.com. Um, for some help and people were very helpful and gave me some suggestions on how I could improve disc performance and uh, so I've been doing that monkeying around with <laughs> raid and stuff geeky how's it been going is it all working now yeah it's all wor- it's, it's always been working it's just right. I want to try and get the absolute maximum throughput to these discs and I think I'm probably reaching the best I can with like retail 7200 rpm discs I don't think I can get much quicker unfortunately they're quite sweet little units these we should talk about yeah. them in a bit more depth soon yeah, we should actually, yeah. Because I think Mark's got one as well. Yes. Oh, right, okay. So yeah. we have two experts. That's good. That's two <laughs> more than that we far. normally have. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, what have you been up to? Um, I have been doing a number of things. Um, oh, I went to the Doctor Who experience yesterday up in oh, London. Yes. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. And how was that? It was good. It was very scary. But we're not allowed to tell you what happens. Oh, that's true. Fact, Why not? Don't spoil it. Spoilers. Yeah, spoilers. spoilers. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was very good. Very good. Cool. Very exciting. Um, what about uh, Alan too? Alan Stunt Bell. Mark. <laughs> Stunt, Stunt Mark. Mark. Alan Bell of oh, the yeah. Open Learning Centre. Yes. Oh, well, well n- not the Open Learning Centre anymore. That, that, oh, that, you've that, left? That one is so last week. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> we interviewed you back in season one, didn't we? <laughs> we, we did. Some, sometime ago. back in season one. I'm yeah. sure the, the obsessive compulsive listeners will be going back and checking which episode it was. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of those. <laughs> Um, we're, we're going through a rebranding exercise at the minute, and uh, we're going to be called, uh, we are called now Libertus Solutions. Mm. Ah, some of your products were called Libertus. You had a Libertus server, didn't you? Yes. You're like yes. harmonizing the name across all the. Yes, or lacking originality. <laughs> <laughs> when all else fails, go Latin. That's right, yes. Yes, yes we like a bit of Latin. Oh, well, cool. don't you get the wing commander started on Latin again. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, what about you? Um, I went on a boat. Spent the weekend on canal boat, and Tony uh, yes. did too. To be fair, yes. he's blocking it out. Yes, <laughs> we we Was went there a lot of locks. We went through 108 locks. Wow! In I think we said we averaged over the time that we were actually moving one every 13 minutes. Wow! Yeah, something like did that. Did you do anything but travel through locks? No, no, not really. It was, it great. was great. It was brilliant. Relaxing holiday. Do you have lots of Kendall mint cake? No, Kendall. Oh, we were Twilight. Well, yeah, we were very well supplied with food, I have to say. Yes. Um, so Amy Thanks to Neil, Amy for catering. Who, who do listen to this show. This, this, is, this is Amy who refers to this show as the Tony and Laura that, show. That's, that's right, the one. Yes. Yeah, totally <laughs> we do know them in real life. We don't make a habit of going on holiday with listeners from the podcast. Just right. To <laughs> Just to clarify in case anyone was in any doubt. Right. So, uh, yes. That was good fun, was it? Yeah, Excellent. it was brilliant. Okay. Well, we better get on with the show. So while we've got um, Alan Bell here, um, Alan's... uh uh, an Ubuntu enthusiast and contributor, Ubuntu member, and also the UK Loco team leader. But as well as all of that, um, I understand you do some stuff with the um, accessibility team. And I wanted to have a chat with you about what the accessibility team does, and uh, because I know very little about it, really. And I think probably some of our listeners probably don't know much about it either. So what does okay. accessibility mean in Ubuntu? Uh well, uh, or even in general. In, in general, let's just go, go back a bit there. So, um, uh, accessibility is about making sure that uh, the computer is available to be used by everyone, um, okay. and people aren't excluded from using uh, using the computer or using Ubuntu in, in our instance uh, by way of any physical impairment. Okay, so we're talking people who um, have impaired visibility or hearing or motor movement or something like that. 
I- exactly those um, okay. kind of areas, yes. And what do we do to help that? <laughs> uh, well, for there are, are a number of different uh, tools within, within Ubuntu, either um, in main and on the disk or in the repositories, uh, to uh, bits of assistive technology. Uh, so there are things like the, the screen reader uh, called Orca, which, and uh, a text-to-speech engine called eSpeak, uh, which are on the disk by default, which allows you to navigate the desktop without um, using your eyes. <laughs> okay, so how does that work? Does it speak to you and tell you you're on a window or something? Something like that, yes. Okay. It will read out the window title and tell right. you where you're focused. And, uh, and button names and things? Yes, and, and every... Every button can have its title, its visible title, title and an accessibility title as well. Hey, um, why would they be different? It, it depends on context. You might be wanting to give more information to the screen reader. Ah, uh, okay, because they can't see what's around the button. So you might want to say more. Rather yeah, than just str- struggling to think okay. of a good example. <laughs> yeah, so am I. So uh, I things think. like state of a bun- button? It, it will tell you what's focused, um, mm. certainly. And there's a, a dazzling array of keyboard shortcuts to yes. um, navigate around the screen. Well, other than the usual, like, tab and enter? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. So there's, like, keyboard shortcuts, like, control yes. and a letter. Yes, it, 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 um, it operates in two keyboard modes, whether, whether you're using a laptop or a desktop with a separate num- numeric keypad. And if you've got the, a separate number pad to, to the side of your keyboard... Uh, all of those become uh, shortcuts to do different things with the screen reader, like ask it to read out where you are or what's what your uh, what, what's around the cursor. Oh wow! Um, but that's just uh, uh, one and, tool. And uh, when you talk about buttons and things you press and things on the screen, is that and you said it's on the CD? Is that active from the moment the CD boots, or because I've never heard it speak to me on on an Ubuntu CD? Uh-huh. So how, how how does it how does it know to talk to me? How does it know I can't see it? Okay, so um, what we'll have to do now is reveal one of the embarrassing fails. <laughs> that's good. That's good. We like that. So when you when you put in your live CD, uh, the first thing that happens is you get uh, a sort of dark purpley screen, and at the bottom of that screen there is a little odd symbol of a, of a person <laughs> like. Um, uh, oh yes, it looks like a gent's toilet sign, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. Okay. The gent's toilet sign and a keyboard next to it. And, and that, when you see that with your eyes, you press the space bar and then you can navigate through some other things to get to... Um... I can spot a floor in this. <laughs> yes, well done. Yes. So, <laughs> and I, I'm not even using my eyes. <laughs> yeah, so we've, we've been sort of campaigning for a beep. <laughs> okay. Um, Is that why anyhow. other platforms like OS X make a... A funny dong when they start up. Uh, that, I'm theory? not familiar with this OS X of which you speak. <laughs> <laughs> you must have seen the film Wall E. <laughs> it makes the same noise. It's like a dong. Uh, probably. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, anyhow, the, if you hit the keyboard at the right moment and then hit another obscure key sequence, something like <laughs> F3, down, down, F5, return. <laughs> you, you get right, God right, up, 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 down. <laughs> yes. Uh, and then wait, wait a few minutes. That Then the, the screen reader will start talking to you and uh, wow, guide, guide you bad, through isn't ubiquity. It? It's a bit of a fail. Yeah. However, there are plans to make it uh, less failsome in Oniric. Okay. So anyone who does any kind of development... Um, is or should be doing accessibility stuff. It's really, really worthwhile, I discovered, um, to actually try it out, try out a screen reader, just to because it, it, the, you can't describe what it's like to use a, a screen it's, reader. It's really you have to experience it. Yeah. Um, and then you've got to imagine what it's like at something like say, five, ten times the speed that you're listening to it with lots of quick sh- keyboard shortcuts and then get an idea of how it is for somebody who's actually blind using it. Yeah. Yes, it's amazing it's, how fast... Um, blind people can mm, yes. uh, listen. Uh, they listen about six times uh, yeah. regular speed. It's amazing. Uh, wow. And it's understandable at that speed. Well, probably not for us. <laughs> <laughs> not very for, for me. No, I can't, no. Can't it has follow. a weird accent, isn't it, Orca? <laughs> Orca itself doesn't. Orca speaks to a Speech Dispatcher, which is part of the Ubuntu framework, and that passes the text that Orca wants to say to a speech synthesizer. And you can swap out different ones. Oh, okay. So, oh, so you can choose female voice or something like that? Or, yeah. Right. 
But the, the, the one that's on the CD is called eSpeak, which is very good, very, um, very good when speeded up. Right. Uh, and it's, but it's quite a mechanical voice. Stephen um, Hawking style? Yeah. Right, okay. Um, you can plug in hardware external synthesizers and have Orca speak through them through the magic of speech dispatcher. Cool. There's a lot more to accessibility than uh, just getting Orca running. So right. Things like uh, on-screen keyboards, which... Ah, okay. So, yeah, I would have seen those anyway on, like, touch devices, like tablets and on things. T- yeah, absolutely on tablets. Um, so why are they there for an accessibility reasons? Uh, if you're struggling to use the keyboard, but you've got some form of a pointer. Ah, okay. Uh, th- there are also um, on-screen keyboards which can be used with a switch. So if you if you only have the the ability to uh, to use a clicker, mm-hmm. um, it will um, flash between the sort of left and right side of the keyboard, and then you click when the side you want is on. Right. And it'll do rows, and then you click and okay. then you select a row, and then select the key. So you can type very very slowly. Or, well, very but laboriously, you but you, yes. you can type with right. just um, uh, just just a single switch. But the more control you have, the, uh, the 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 more advanced techniques you can use of operating the on-screen keyboard. So, how well do you think Ubuntu compares with either other, other Linux distributions or other less less open source operating systems, perhaps like Windows or Mac? Or do we do well? Do we serve? You know. It, it, it comes and goes, really, and uh, right, okay. part of what we've got to do is stop breaking things. <laughs> uh, the the accessibility regressions have been um, you know, quite unfortunate. Um, some things have been uh, been made harder to use. Yeah. Well, what what do you think causes that? Is there is it the new design and stuff, or the um, change in versions of GTK or something? What 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 drives the breakage of this stuff? Uh, well. The things like the splash screen uh, breaking the the old grub menu, um, so you've now got the on the live CD boot it goes straight past the the menu um, by default, and you've got to press a button to get back to it. Uh, um, so that's a sort of new shininess that's been introduced, and the full implications of what was there before weren't fully um, taken into account. And um, at the moment in Unity. Um, in Unity 3D, where it's drawn with the NUX framework over the top of Compiz, you can't type into the Unity search bar using a on-screen keyboard. So that breaks in a whole variety of input methods oh, really? with Unity. Yeah. That sucks. Because that's like the main way in which you're supposed to find your applications is open up that dash thing and then type in it. Yeah, it's a bit of, a, bit of an oops. Ooh, Okay. Um, and one of the reasons why, under the accessibility profiles, um, you boot by default into classic mode. Uh, okay. So, do you think that um, it's slow but steady progress, little oopses aside, or it, should we be doing more to help uh, people who have got some sort of restricted capability engage and with Ubuntu, either as community members or developers or contributors in some way? Okay, so there's two parts to that question, really. So, okay. uh, are, are we moving forward or backwards? Uh, yeah, both at the same time. Oh, uh, brilliant! Um, okay. <laughs> uh, so there, there are backward steps and there are forward steps, and I think the forward steps are just about outpacing the backward steps at the minute. Okay. Mm. Um, and the second part of the question: <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Yeah, are we making it easy for people who have got restricted? For... What, what, what more should we do? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Absolutely, we should be doing more. Um, and you know, I would love to see more people who are developing for Ubuntu uh, using the accessibility features uh, just because they're there. Um, so if you want to install Ubuntu on um, a, a new computer, why not try and do it using the, uh, the one of the accessibility installs and see how it goes, see whether you can um, do it with your eyes shut. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I mean, do you think lack of awareness is a problem, is a key pro- part of the problem of the regressions because people just aren't aware of the consequences of what they do when they change something? For the re- regressions, certainly that's a big part of it. Yeah. Uh, and there, there'll, be an, there'll be another example with the uh, switch from uh, GDM to light DM. Mm. Uh, that's some of the GDM features for starting a screen reader um, 
aren't there at the minute in light dm but they should be there by the time it becomes the default display manager so what sort of help does the accessibility team need for the next release or the next few releases anything specific or just cake <laughs> <laughs> well cake is appreciated by everybody i think i'm sure um it would be great to have more people involved in the team uh, and some of the projects that we're working on. Um, one of the projects that we're doing at the moment is a series of uh, persona documents where we're creating fictional characters with different uh, sets of accessibility needs. Uh, it's part of a, a sort of communication tool to uh, educate people about um, about accessibility. Um, and bring it to life a bit more rather than saying oh we need this application to work with a screen reader um you know we've we've got um a character and we want to motivate people differently and so well, my application is broken for henrietta so right so this is similar to the way in which we have use cases on the wiki for um certain uh, scenarios yes absolutely right so you have a use case where henrietta wants to use her um, audio reader app because she wants to fulfill a particular task and she has a background in whatever and there's a whole persona behind her exactly yes yes and wow. um, yeah, we want people to understand that it, if the, if their application isn't usable by all the other personas um, then it is broken yeah it kind of humanizes the people it's less of an abstract yes. you need to work with as you say with a screen reader or whatever it makes people hopefully makes people empathize we, sorry, I was just going to say, what sort of response do you get from developers when somebody ra raises a bug or, use, you know, say, the accessibility team spots an issue with a particular application? It doesn't work under one of these use cases. They raise a bug, launch a pad. Uh, is it genuinely, uh, generally a, a positive response or is there some sort of thing, well, this is a bit of an edge case? Uh, or does it get marked not wish list? Or... Uh, no, it's, it's almost always a positive response. I, I'm not aware of any non-positive responses to oh, bugs good. that have been raised. Uh, people people want their application to be used by everybody. Uh, it's it's a case of lack of testing and um, and, and lack of awareness. So sometimes fixing the bugs are not easy, uh, like the, um, the 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 issue in Unity where it's hard to type into that using a, an on screen keyboard. That's not an easy thing to fix. Um, but that's because but that's, of the design decisions that were made earlier on. Didn't take this into account when it was created in the first place yeah i would i would argue that yes yeah. <laughs> and and also the the fact that we ship every six months okay we're aiming for an lts in 1204 but because we ship a new release every six months do we just not give ourselves enough time in the cycle to get that stuff working there is an element of that and uh yes we are quite focused on on the lts releases for for accessibility so um unity has come in and is uh not entirely fully baked for accessibility purposes, but there is a supported um, LTS Ubuntu with classic mode until let's say, 2013. Mm. Um, we'd like to get Unity fully baked well before then. Yeah. Well, you said that in the the um, the fallback for if you want to use a screen reader would be the fallback, which is GNOME uh, two-panel um, desktop in yes. the current version of Ubuntu. Well, in as I understand it, 11.10. It's Unity 3D as the main interface, Unity 2D as the backup. And um, are, we, are we focusing attention on Unity 3D and 2D rather than the two-panel loan? Uh, yes, we are. Yes, right. we're, we're focusing on, on those th issues. Unity 2D is um, uh, based on QML um, and has issues with... Um, uh, has it, needs to be exposed properly so that Orca can read it. Right, okay. But that's just different types of bugs than the bugs we already have. Yes, yeah, so there's, a, there's a, a separate stream of bugs between Unity 3D and Unity 2D. Oh, good. <laughs> Keep okay. busy. So if people want to get involved in the accessibility team, where can they go to find out more? Uh, they can find out at uh, wiki.ubuntu.com slash accessibility and find the IRC channel and mailing list. Excellent. Well, Magic. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Alan.
It's time for the news, and Nokia and Apple have settled a long-running patent dispute covering caller ID, display illumination, and 3G and Wi-Fi technology. The settlement resulted in Apple handing Nokia a brown envelope fit to bust and an ongoing license fee for technology they've used. That's one down, and about 50 left of these cases. Brown envelopes? Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, how do I get people to give me a big brown envelope full of cash for software? Invent stuff. Oh, I right. Think. Okay. Yes. I'll go back in the past yeah, and back in stuff. time invent yes. my time machine and then invent I can make some money stuff, right. yeah. Mark Shuttleworth has suggested that Firefox could be replaced as the browser of choice in Ubuntu by Google's Chrome it probably wouldn't happen before 1204 however yeah this is quite good. interesting because mm. we're all was that good from Laura yes because the first one of the first things I do now is install Chrome really mm. yeah I'm a big Chromium fan now yeah you see I, I switched to Chrome everywhere like at work and then I did a clean install recently on my desktop and I kind of forgot to install it because I use LastPass to synchronise all my passwords and everything and there's an extension for Chrome and there's one for Firefox so I just installed it in Firefox and used Firefox and it seemed to work Mm. Okay. That's like Chrome quicker. So was, that, was that Google's Chrome or Chromium? That's what I was wondering. Ah, oh, that's interesting because at the moment it's Chromium, isn't it? Which is the, the, open, the open source, source version, version with the logo taken out. Basically. But the article's about Chrome. Chrome. Well, the article, kind of, yeah, is talking about how interesting Chrome is. I think. Yeah. Maybe they conflated the two. Yeah, fair enough. The software patent wars continue to rumble on with proprietary hardware vendor Apple starting a court action against one of its own suppliers, Samsung, who also happened to make a range of Android phones. That's a nice Android phone you have there, Alan. Uh, yes, it's, it's, it's happens, a Samsung. It, it happens to be a Samsung <laughs> Galaxy S2, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Software giant Adobe have killed off their Linux desktop version of their Air software, saying that the desktop Linux adoption hasn't increased in the past two years. They'll produce a version for Android instead. Cue hundreds of people saying that Android is Linux. Uh, Well, also, cue lots of people saying it's unsurprising that the number of people who run Linux uh, downloading Air um, (laughs) hasn't gone up because it's just rubbish software. What what does Air do? Well, exactly. It's a platform that you can develop web-like apps on the desktop. It allows me to run Balsamic on Linux and Ubuntu. She's so a mock-up to one app. I've never yeah, but I can't run it otherwise. <laughs> I, I remember it being a dependency for the BBC iPlayer client or yes, something. Yes, iPlayer as well, yeah. Okay, I've uh, never used it there. I, I installed it once. I think it might have been for the BBC iPlayer app or might have been for a Twitter client. It seems every Twitter client is written in Adobe Air. Oh, yeah, TweetDeck is, isn't it? Ah, TweetDeck. TweetDeck. Yeah, so. But isn't, isn't it the packaging they're not doing rather than the development I thought they weren't actually just going to make just a Linux version. They were, Android is the Linux version they will make. Huh. And nothing of value was lost. <laughs> <laughs> An article in the Inquirer has recognised the contribution of Michel Jarre, who has single-handedly added support for 235 webcams to Linux. That's proper hard work, that is. That is. That's yeah. sort of one of the unsung heroes of open source yeah. development. 235. And a lot of them are the... Are the cheap, no-name, made-in-China, unbranded things that you get either embedded in a netbook or something or, yeah. you know, off the bargain basement bin at Tesco's. Supermarket, yeah. Yeah, which is really yeah, good. Yeah, it's, it's a good piece of work. It's, uh, it reminds me of um, uh, Till Camter, who yes. works tirelessly for printers. It's like there's one guy on the planet who does webcams, one guy on the planet who does printers, and, you know, probably one for everything else as well. If yes. I had to have a cupboard of... Uh, 235 things. I'd rather it was webcams than printers, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he picked the right one. And it's time for our Og Camp update. It's not so far away now. I think we've only got about two or three episodes before yeah. Og Camp comes around. <laughs> Al- Alan Bell, who isn't Alan Pope, are you coming to Og Camp? I certainly am, yes. Excellent. Excellent. That's good. Well, that's five of us then. Um, <laughs> and we've got some news. So, Alan, do you want to take us... Uh, for Alan Pope, do you want to take us through the, uh, the uh, interesting news? <laughs> yes. Uh, first of all, we've got a new sponsor, and they've given us a bucket of cash to help us... Uh, uh, pay for the event and it's bite mark D- did it come in a brown paper envelope no it came as a direct bank transfer very dull, dull. <laughs> <laughs> but they're very very nice of the people at bite mark to uh, help us run the event by funding 
by a significant amount. They are our very, headline very sponsors. Yes. Um, Helping us pay for the venue. Yeah. Absolutely. So really, without them, we couldn't be doing it. No. Um, so if you need any stuff, go and get it from them. Yes. The message. Mm-hmm. We also have to thank Chris Proctor, who's sponsored on behalf of Log.org.uk as well. Uh, appreciate his efforts and support. And also, uh, Bitfolk are kindly sponsoring a venue for Saturday night. Uh, so after the uh, Ogg Camp day. first day event finishes, yes. we're going to have a bit of a party. Yes. And uh, Bitfolk are sponsoring that. We'll include beer. Really? Well, the event will. Excellent. Yes. So we don't know quite what that's going to be, but we'll have more information about that. So that's the Saturday night do. Um, and also, Laura Tchaikovsky is organising, or has proposed to organise, a geek nick on the Saturday afternoon. If it's good weather. Yes. Um, rather than, you know, letting people stay indoors. Um, or wandering around the town. Wandering around the town. March people over to the park and make them have fun there. <laughs> <laughs> In the rain, yes. if need be. Yes. yes. Um, there is grass and everything. Yes. So, yeah, the idea is you can bring along some food if you want to eat it, some share, some cake, uh, that sort of thing. I'm sure there'll be more information coming out about that too, so listen out for that. Chris Gutteridge is um, going to talk about Southampton Open Data Project on our scheduled track. Ah, so we're going to have a scheduled track. So it's going to be an unconference with some yep. uh, yes. talks. You just turn up and yep. put your name down and give a talk. But we'll have some scheduled speakers as well and... He's one of the first to be uh, named. Yep. Yes, we announced a couple last time, and uh, we're adding Chris to the lineup, and uh, it's going to be some good, good, some good talks, I think, <laughs> if I could say that straight. Yes. I'm really very tired of the 108 locks. <laughs> <laughs> but some mad fools are also camping. Yes. Um, so they're literally making it Og Camp a camp. Yes. Um, and Which I think is very cool. Yes. yes. It's kind of a community organised thing going, and if you're interested in staying on a campsite rather than a hotel, save a few quid, uh, you can email ogcamping at gmail.com. And this is a community organised thing. It's really kind of nothing to do with us. We're not organising this. Some people from the community stepped up yep. and decided to set this whole thing up. So Absolutely. just email them, ogcamping at gmail.com do you know who's involved with that Uh, no (laughs) it's the community a big amorphous blob of people (laughs) they all look the same to us (laughs) oh Oh. so yeah that's ogcamping at gmail.com yes Yes, indeed otherwise I don't know where you'll go Uh, I do (laughs) there's still a handful of tickets left at Eventbrite um, so go to ogcamp11.eventbrite.com to get one or uh, recommend to a friend only a handful left so act fast and also, Fab's created some um, badges that you can put on your website if you want to say, I'm going to OGCAMP and help promote the event. Yeah, they're very shiny. Um, yes, then you can get those if you go to ogcamp.org slash promotion and just grab hold of those images, stick them on your website and let everyone know you're coming along. And I think you're looking for some Blender help, is that right? Uh, that's right. So uh, we're going to be recording uh, the OGCAMP sessions on video and we're, we're looking for someone who can do a, a bit of blender awesomeness um between now and then to okay give us a what what sort nice of awesomeness intro. oh we'll, we'll we'll discuss that uh in in more detail if somebody reckons they can uh, do some animation with blender okay uh, <laughs> if they could get in contact um via the ogcamp contact address which yes. is ogcamp at ubuntu-uk.org excellent um that's all about ogcamp for now and now it's time for Command Line Love. Ooh, haven't had one of these for a few weeks. Okay, so uh, this one is a, is a command that's a bit of a mouthful, so I won't attempt to read it out. That's smart. <laughs> Good <laughs> idea. Uh, and the purpose of it is to create a bash script from the last few commands you've typed. So you're, you're typing something in the terminal, you've gone through a bit of a procedure, and you think, well, that was a mouthful, but it worked. Um, I should do that again sometime. I should have made that into a script instead of type it all in. Okay. I do that so, it, so it, often. <laughs> <laughs> it uses the history command, piped into tail, into head, into said, and then into a script. Excellent. Okay, and it puts out one file that you can then use to recreate all those, is it? You can re- reproduce um, what you last, what, what the last n commands, um, and uh, yeah, make a script out of them. And so that you don't have to guess it all, we're going to put that on the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't have to oh. read out all the curly brackets. <laughs> yeah. We're just going to say vaguely, history, tale, said, figure it out for yourself. I don't even know what some of those characters are called. <laughs> yeah, that uh, is... Then numbers. Uh... <laughs> 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 and uh, that's it for the command line love. we
we're going slightly off piste now on the Ubuntu UK podcast, and we're going to talk to Barnaby Edwards from Textbook Stuff. Hello, Barnaby. Hello there. How are you? Not too bad, thank you. How are you? Very well indeed, thank you, on this lovely, cloudy, come sunny evening. Yeah, it's pretty sunny here where we are in, in our echoey Studio B, um, but it's, it's cloudy for you, is it, at the moment? Well, uh, it's, it's mixed weather. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so tell us a bit about Textbook Stuff. What's it all about? Well, Textbook Stuff is an audiobook company, a digital audiobook company. Um, uh, we don't release anything on CD uh, or cassette. Uh, it all uh, comes out as downloads. Uh, and we, we do unabridged audiobooks of um, classic stories and uh, poetry and nonfiction titles. Um, and they're all enhanced with state of the art sound effects and uh, sort of full incidental cinematic mu- music scores. Uh, and we um, we have about 10 or 12 titles. We started uh, about this time last year. Uh, and we've got some fantastic readers, including Martin Jarvis and Miriam Margulies and John Sessions and David Soule and Andrew Sachs and many others. Mm. Um, and we're sort of building from there. We're available in a whole range of different uh, online marketplaces. What what got you started in this? Because I understand your, your background. You're, you're an artist yourself. But um, what, what got you started in this? Well, I started out acting uh, quite a bit in radio, and I still do that. Uh, And then, because of (laughs) the process of of longevity of a career, you you tend to to move from acting to directing more. Um, So I I, I direct quite a lot of audio as well for the for the BBC and for a company called Big Finish, who do audio Doctor Who and various other Ah. titles. Um, and then I started writing for them as well. And in the course of doing that, I was commissioned to uh, adapt The Phantom of the Opera for BBC Radio 7, which is now Radio 4 Extra. And um, uh, in the course of doing that, I I sort of thought, well, there there are a huge number of of great classic texts that could really be enhanced with with, uh, fantastic sound design and and music, and then I was thinking about adapting some other titles, and I thought, well, why adapt them? Why not just try and do all of that music and sound effects to an unabridged reading so you get the entire text, but it's fully enhanced, and whenever a character speaks in dialogue, then that dialogue is placed within a scene just as it would be within a radio play. And that's really what got me started. I couldn't believe there wasn't anyone else doing it. And now having started it and realized how much work is involved, I now know why there isn't anyone else doing it. Yeah, because a lot of uh, traditional audio books that I've been familiar with in the past have been readings of the text, but dry, just to somebody reading the words, like Douglas Adams' version of his books and, and the Stephen Fry, Harry Potter things, you know. Yeah. Um, so what is it you think that, uh, that brings, to the, uh, brings to the experience having all these extra effects and doing all this extra work? Well, it utterly immerses you in the world of the novel. So if you're in, you know, a Dickens story and it's got... Uh, uh, horse and cart going through a deserted street or something like that. If you hear that in your head at the same time that you, uh, you hear the words, and if there are two characters talking in a hushed tone and you hear them from, you know, one from the left-hand side of, the, of the, your stereo headphones and one from the right-hand side, and then a sort of central narrator placed, it really makes the whole thing an utterly immersive experience. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very pleased that we've had five-star reviews from every single person who's ever listened to them or written a review of them which is fantastic um and uh, a lot of that is is uh, is down to my brilliant sound designer and, and composer a man called howard carter who is not the howard carter who discovered the tomb of tutankhamun yeah. um <laughs> it's a slightly younger gentleman familiar. um but yeah he he you know we worked together very uh, closely about creating the whole world the sound world and then and then putting it putting the it's got, they've all got single narrators, so you have one person narrating uh, the story. But because you've got such, I mean, I've deliberately chosen very versatile actors like John Sessions and Miriam Margulies, um, because all of the character voices have proper full character voices. So it's like a full radio play, but read by one person. So what's the scope of the um, text that you choose? Well, because of the... Um, elaborate nature of the of the sound design and uh we're, we're tending to go for texts that are come in under um under two hours really simply because it's, it's too expensive to do it i mean it'd be fantastic to do bleak house and do 35 hours <laughs> of this but 
it, I would have to charge people a thousand pounds a download, yeah. which I don't think people are going to pay for. Um, so we initially, moving on from the from the Phantom of the Opera that I did for the BBC, we thought, well, we'll we'll, we'll launch with ghost stories because that's something that really does, you know, a music and sound design can really add to that experience. Mm. Um, and uh, so we then moved on to poetry titles, and then uh, we've just had our first non-fiction title, The Communist Manifesto, which has just come out and is selling very well, which is very pleasing. Um, so the choice is really, and when I'm, when I'm choosing those stories, I read through, for example, with the Edgar Allan Poe's, I read through maybe 30 or 40 Edgar Allan Poe short stories and selected five that I wanted, and those five were the five that I thought would work best as uh, in an audiobook format. I mean, there are some stories that are just a letter that's written out, and yes, it's brilliantly done, but it's not as exciting as having a story where, where you know, you, you have a, a car chase or something like that, because you can actually bring that to life far better in, in uh, the audio environment. So, uh, these are, you said there are a lot of, um, a lot of classics and uh, that, that you're reading out or get, getting read out. Are these uh, works where the copyright has expired, or are you negotiating yes. now, with copyright? there's a very rights? interesting reason why I chose that. Um, it's less to do with the extra cost of paying for uh, a copyright, because I'm sure many of your listeners will know, uh, if an author died um, less than 70 years ago, or indeed their translator died less than 70 years ago, um, then you have to pay copyright on that, and that is normally about 10 percent of the gross uh and that's you know that that's a certain uh, amount of money but the, the the reason why i'm going for out of copyright ones is because if you wish to release something in digital format globally you have to get the permission from every single publishing company oh, around wow. the world so for example if i wanted to do the penguin edition of um uh, let us say, Plato's Republic, um, the translation for that is still in copyright. So I would have to apply for copyright permission from Penguin UK, Penguin New York, Penguin Australia, Penguin Far East, Penguin South Africa, and about <laughs> nine Penguin uh, companies. And unless I have that permission, I can't release worldwide on iTunes. But by choosing something that's out of copyright, you're, you're in the clear straight away. Absolutely. Even then, there are slightly tricky areas uh, there's a, a litigation case at the moment, or two litigation cases in America, to do with, um, well, to do with Conan Doyle, who is out of copyright. Um, but there is a there are some claimant in America currently taking people to court over that, claiming that she has copyright on on Conan Doyle, and she can't legally have it, but she's she's trying to take them to court. <laughs> um, and the other one is the um, H.P. Lovecraft Cthulhu Mythos ones, which again are out of copyright but again there's a big litigation cause where someone is trying to register the name cthulhu as a trademark uh, and they've already done that with conan the barbarian so even though that's out of copyright you can't use that so there are sort of tricky ones but generally speaking if the author died over 70 years ago you're pretty much safe and one of the things that we noticed is that you're distributing these in mp3 format which isn't protected by drm no so... i don't i think if someone is going to buy something from me then uh, I don't want to treat them as a criminal um, or, or suspect them of pirating it. Uh, you know, they, they've put their faith in me, and I'm very happy to trust them. So I don't like DRM. I want them to come out DRM-free so that people can copy them onto their home computers and cut them to CDs and play in their car if they want to. Um, and, uh, you know, I have faith in people's honesty, and I think, generally speaking, if you start putting a whole load of copyright protection on it and digital watermarking and things like that, the real criminals will know how to break that in under a, under a minute. <laughs> uh, and the non-real criminals, the vast majority of your customer base, um, will feel slightly insulted by it. That's certainly something I think that we'd agree with here and probably yeah. most of our listeners as well. <laughs> Um, one of the things that, again, we talked about was the sort of the high quality of the audio recording, you know, working with all these uh, uh, very experienced artists and the, and the effects and things. Um, did you look at releasing in any other formats, uh, like FLAC, which is a, a lossless audio uh, format at all, or was it just MP3? Well, no, we did look at a whole range of different formats, about MP4 and FLAC and things like that. The, the, the problem that I wanted to, to overcome was I wanted to have a very a universal one that... that 
uh, audio files and total novices can all work with. And the MP3 still is the sort of the gold mm, standard the on that. Factor, isn't it? Um, we don't, you know, we record in far higher qualities on MP3 um, and uh, we're recording higher quality than WAV. Um, but we, you know, we have it on, on 320 kilobytes per second, which is um, the highest quality MP3 audio that you can get. And just to put that into perspective, if you download an audio book from iTunes from the audio book section, we're not in the audio book section, we're in the music section, we oh, come out to spoken word. But if you download it from the audiobook section, you're, you're downloading that at 50 kbps, and we are 320, so we are six times that audio quality. Wow. I noticed the, um, uh, when I click the Buy It Now links on your website, they take me straight to um, iTunes, so I can you know, download them um, straight onto my um, iPhone or iPad or whatever. Um, do you cater for people who aren't tied into the Apple ecosystem as well? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we're, uh, you know, we're very inclusive. We're, we're distributed on iTunes, Amazon, Play.com, Tesco.com, HMV.com, uh, Tune Tribe, We7, Lulu, 7 Digital, um, and Snack, which is a French one. Uh, and ah, you can Fnac. even buy it direct from us, from our own website, textbookstuff.com. Ah, now that's really interesting because Seven Digital that you mentioned is the service that's behind the Ubuntu One Music Store, which uh-huh. is a music store that's integrated into the Ubuntu software about which we talk generally on this podcast. Uh-huh. So presumably that means that you, would be good. We should we should double out. check it, but presumably that means you could buy the audio books through Don't the Ubuntu through One Music it. Store. Yeah, that would be good. Excellent. Well, well, that would be very good. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, and uh, finally, uh, we we'll talked a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about accessibility. Um, uh, because obviously uh, audio books are not uh, accessible to people who are uh, hard of hearing, things like that. Um, or is there anything you can do to help people with that sort of issue? They are, of course, a very good way of accessing the books for the blind, aren't they? Absolutely, yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, the, audio, the main appeal of audio books is, is um, uh, to have a, you know, people who don't have time to read the book or people who are, have read maybe the short stories and they didn't get on with them and then suddenly they, they're brought to life on audio. Uh, and obviously for, for accessibility, audio books are tailor-made for people who are, are uh, visually impaired and we have a lot of customers who are. Um, so because we're distributed via all these different sites, mm. um, we're, we're piggybacking onto their, their advanced technology. I mean, iTunes and Amazon are, are very up on um, uh, on accessibility for for um, people who are visually impaired. In terms of um, people who are uh, uh, sort of hearing impaired, um, what we have on our website is because uh, we want to bring everyone in. We have a, a whole load of uh, forums about literature. Um, we have um, sort of in-site Amazon stores as well, which are, have book lists which have been selected. We have a, a literary advisor, and he selects um, our in which editions of, of various books and which biographies and bibliographies we should go for. He selects those, and we then have in-store bookstores for each author, so for Dickens and Poe and the Brontes and uh, Christina Rossetti and, and all these authors. Each individual page will have its own bookshop. So if you uh, can't experience the audio book, um, we're pointing you to exactly the right text to read. Um, so people can, can read it there, and they can ask us questions, and we have... Um, a lot of uh, visual material, a lot of covers. If people want to become free members of our of our um, website, which they can do, um, then they can download high quality covers and things like that. And we're looking into doing PDFs of the scripts as well. We've got a production just about to come out of um, Sheridan Levenu's great female vampire story, Carmilla, and we're releasing the uh, PDF of the script of that, so people can see how that how it's pieced together and how we insert oh, all wow. the stage directions. And, of course, they'll get a complete copy of the text. Oh, wow. That sounds really good. Yeah. And I think just to wrap up, you've got a, a competition for us, I think. Um, I have. Well, it's just it's very hard for people to understand quite how exciting um, a, a fully-fledged audiobook can be with all these effects and, and, and things under them. So I thought, well, why not have a competition where I can give one away? Um, and uh, I, do you want me to set the question? Yeah, go for it. Okay, well, the audiobook I think we should give away is the first one that we released, which is uh, Charles Dickens' The Signalman, which is arguably the greatest ghost story of all time. And there are another four Dickens ghost stories on that release. So it's The Signalman and other ghostly tales. 
and that's read by the brilliant John Sessions. Uh -huh. So you can get that if you win this competition. And your question is, which novel did Dickens leave unfinished at his death? Mm, okay, cool. So we'll accept um, questions yeah. on, we'll give out the details on how people can get in touch. Yep, and, they uh, can send an email into competition at ubuntu-uk.org and what we'd like to do is uh, pick a winner in episode uh, 11 of this season so if you get them in before we record episode 11 watch out the website for details of that um, and then we'll pick a winner uh, in that episode so competition at ubuntu-uk.org I had to think of our own email address there so, and the question again is which novel did Dickens leave unfinished at his death? Excellent. Well, thank you very much indeed for talking to us this yeah, evening, Barnaby. I hope you uh, go to, from strength to strength with textbook stuff. Thank you very much. And uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. You too. Cheers, Thanks, then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. It's been a pleasure. And now it's time for the bit about Ubuntu. Yay! Hurrah! Uh, and in the first piece of news, uh, Ubuntu are looking to create a new ISO image sized somewhere between a CD and a DVD, probably about one and a half gig. Oh. And the idea is this would be ideal for carrying around on a two gig USB stick, which are, you know, super cheap these days. You can get free yes. with a packet of crisps uh, with a bit of room to spare and then still have a larger image, which can hold more than the CD, but less than the DVD. Right, okay. This is a good thing. It sort of gets away from having to struggle to fit everything onto just a CD size, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, the CD will still be there, and there will still be that struggle. But, yes. But if you're, if you're the kind of person who, you know, wants to have a USB to cart around, and you want to have, like, all the bits and bobs you need, then chances are that image will have more. Okay. Is there something to do with um, the 2 gig limit that is limiting... I mean, why not no. a four gig limit or an eight gig limit? Well, or... um, because um, if you if you look at the size of a CD, it's like seven hundred meg, and one and a half uh, gig is only just over double that. Yeah, sure. Whereas a DVD is many times seven hundred meg, so it's it's really just a proportion of you know how much harder is it for you to download over your internet connection to get a DVD image than it is to get a CD. And this one and a half is a mm. gig is only is a compromise. It's only one more ISO image, size-wise, over one ISO image, if that makes sense. <laughs> right. Okay. okay, it's double, but, yeah. <laughs> but it's not that big. Uh, Scott Rosenquist on the IRC channel, hash Ubuntu-UK-podcast on Freenode, has said that he'd like to see an image that has the whole desktop installed, but no actual applications. Wow. Yeah. Well, so you can then pick and choose, and I, people keep asking for that actually, like a, a, a like a pared down thing where you just add. You know, you might want on one machine, you might want to add Open Office, on another, you might only want Abbey Word or something like that. Yeah, but then that kind of takes away from what Ubuntu is all about, which is about selecting the best of breed. Exactly. And Evan Dandrea uh, has emailed the tech board with an update to his uh, proposal to measure success and failure in the installation. And uh, we've talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yes. This is, uh, he's expanded on, on his uh, Yeah, so proposal. previously it was kind of just counting the number of um, installs. It's booted to the desktop without yeah. counting, basically, wasn't and it? And it would, in inverted commas, phone home. I realise that's a... A phrase that conjures up images in people's minds, but you know the idea is it feeds back to some central location controlled by the Ubuntu project, um, some useful information, yeah. but not personally identifiable information. And this proposal is to collect more data. Yeah, he's expanded it a bit to find out more details about why things failed. So it's not just did did we succeed in installing or not, but if we failed, why did we fail? At what point did we yeah. fail? Because it, it is kind of pointless knowing that 50% of your desktops fail to install if you don't find out why they fail to install. This is very true. I, I just have a mental image now of Evan propped in the shopping basket of a bicycle phoning home. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not that kind of phone home. Okay. E.T. phoning home Indeed. was a good thing. Yes. Yeah. I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. I mean... No, it seems to be done with no, reasonable uh, care over people's privacy and things. Yeah, it's not being implemented like willy-nilly with, you know, uh, no respect for people's... Mm, um, privacy. Privacy. And, you know, there will be an option to turn it off if you want to, I'm sure. 
It looks Indeed. like a sound proposal to me. Yes. Uh, and there's more news about uh, free software cloud-based syncing things, of which we've had a plethora in recent episodes. Yes. Um, SparkleShare, which I always hear as SparkleShare, as in Mr. Sparkle from the Simpsons episode. No. Mr. Sparkle. <laughs> no. No? no? Okay. Really? No. Right. That's just me. Uh, it's now in Debian Experimental, which means it should be uh, in Ubuntu and Eric by the time that it yeah, that'll be reaches good. production. Yeah, should be. Yeah. Because I think the same guy, I think Ian Lane, actually, uh, Laney on IRC did it uh, or proposed it for Debian. So I suspect and he's on the, it's a, a mono-based app, so he's on the Debian mono team and the Ubuntu mono people. What's the difference between Sparkle Share and some of the other options? What was its USP? Um, I think, isn't Sparkle Share all-encompassing does the whole thing, so you don't have to rely on having, for example, with Syncany, you had to rely on having something else, like an IMAP server to upload to. Yeah. Or with um, one of the others, own cloud, didn't you mm, have to rely on having... just the server, a, wasn't it? Didn't you need a Git uh, repository to store stuff in? As I understand it, Sparkle Share does the whole kind of kit and caboodle itself. Right, okay. Uh, so you could run the server on your own server and the client on your own client, and it does everything itself. Uh, okay, I'm with you. And it's shiny when it has sparkly logos. It's good. So that makes it better. It cool. is immediately better because it sparkles. Yes. And it's in Debian, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that too. Yeah. <laughs> in our occasional Bizarre Bug of the Week slot, we have bug number 799708, titled Greek Philosopher on Screen, in which the bug reporter writes... The full trash icon looks so much like a bust of an ancient Greek philosopher. He looks evil and it is distressing. <laughs> yeah, this is weird. Uh, yes. Have you looked at the picture? Yeah. There was a screenshot. Basically, I missed the, the picture. Bug. Basically, they, when they asked him to, for more information, as you do, and so he's provided... A sc- <laughs> oh, well, you wouldn't just ask him to just go away. <laughs> <laughs> no, obviously, you've got to take everything seriously. Um, and there's a screenshot of the uh, waste paper bin, um, full, and alongside it, a picture of Pythagoras. Um, and then there's also a picture of the monitor icon, uh, which includes a right angled triangle. Mm, conspiracy. Where everybody forever. knows what Pythagoras is famous mm. for. And they're wondering if there's a secret um, Pythagoras sect. Is this a, D- a Dan Brown style conspiracy? I think so. Um, and, pe- and yes, there's a lot of serious discussion around it. And. Oh, um, there's also the suggestion that maybe we should tell the Pythagoras sect that maybe they should be more careful and less conspicuous. <laughs> I personally think, and I have thought for some time, but I never thought to file a bug about it, <laughs> that, the, that the trash looks like Mr. Gumby from uh, Monty Python. It, oh, okay, right. If yes. You, if you look very carefully, it does Surely look that's like a just the head. The head of Mr. Gumby. Gumby. It's a feature, not a bug. Yes. And that's all in the bit about Ubuntu, but we've got a not about Ubuntu this time. Yeah, Fedora 16 may switch to ButterFS or BTRFS, however you want to say it. Um, and for those who don't know, I asked our non-resident ButterFS expert, <laughs> Hugo, to sum up what's so good about this new file system. And, and he said, ButterFS has checksums, compression, online resize, native RAID, online disk management, error recovery, sub-volumes, snapshots, and super cow powers. So I think oh, that'll that. That's yeah. all you need. It yeah. doesn't have a working FSCK command. Ah, now that's not strictly true. It, it does have a working FSCK command, but it doesn't correct errors. So it can scan and find them, right. as I understand it, but it can't correct them. So but that's about as useful as a chocolate teapot. Yes. Or indeed a hot knife through butter FS. <laughs> oh, <laughs> damn when he says uh, super cow powers. Um, is he is he having a laugh or is he referring to a copy on write feature? I think he is, yes. Copy on write. So I don't know what that does. Isn't that the thing where it only writes to the disk it, in the bits that have data in them so you can have sparse kind of... No, not quite. You, you've got a um, an initial image which might be... Re- you might keep read only. It might be a CD. And then oh. whenever you write to something, you don't actually write to it. You make a copy of it somewhere else and... Point Ooh. that file to the something else, some, the somewhere else. Oh. So, so forever you, undo. Yeah, you can just throw away the whole thing and get back to where you were to begin with. It does sound really cool, and it, I, I'd be great if Fedora sixteen led the way and found all the bugs, <laughs> <laughs> so that we could take the crown and use it in twelve ten. And uh, we wouldn't get as much whinges. Fantastic. Exactly. Yes. Cool. And that's all in the bit about Ubuntu and not about Ubuntu this time. <laughs> Now 
it's time for some feedback. Aldo Naguera left a comment on the website. I'm not a native English speaker, so this podcast is hard to understand sometimes, especially when I'm on the bus and you interview someone. Then it's necessary to raise the volume of my player. The problem is when the music comes in too loud, really loud. Could you please lower the volume of the music a tiny bit? Tony. Yes. That's the short answer. Uh, yeah, because we do this live, um, things happen that we don't always have time to fix. Um, people will start to talk from a different angle into the microphone, or they get quieter or louder and stuff, and I have to throw things at people to get them to fix this. Um, but we're going to try harder to make sure it's, it all sounds better. It's certainly an issue that's only come up in this season since we've done it live, yes. whereas previously yes. you would mix it before exactly. we release it. It's, it's, I, I would spend time yeah, compressing it and louder. making it all sound better than I have the time to do these days. <laughs> but yes, um, we'll try harder in future. Jerry Clement commented... Uh, Alan's Pope, com- Alan Pope's comment <laughs> about the strangeness of buying the Asus Triple E at Toys R Us caught my ear. I bought my first Commodore 64 at Toys R Us. It was the only place they were readily available, as I recall. <laughs> They were computers in those days were available in bizarre places. There were strange shops. I bought my Spectrum in a record shop. I wow. only remember them being in Dixon's window. Oh. Tandys. I used to sell oh. computers. Oh they? yeah. Tandy. Those were the days. Uh, maybe you could write in and tell us bizarre places you've purchased computers if you have done so and you're old <laughs> enough to remember them. Could be in the bath. <laughs> Dave. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, yes. Uh, Jason Simmons emailed podcast at ubuntu-uk.org to say... It was great to hear your opinions about making Linux servers easier to administer. I'm quite comfortable with the command line. However, I don't have time to maintain and craft scripts to build and populate LDAP or uh, DHCP um, and bind config files. I prefer a Linux environment, but would love the ease of use of Microsoft MMC or Active Directory. I'm also not saying that every server should have a full-blown GUI. Look at tools like sysvrvconf, which is a fantastic tool and runs in a console. I would love to see some Ubuntu, to see Ubuntu do some of the same things with the high level of fit and finish which they're known for. Yeah, a nice theme on Webmin. That'll do. That's a, it's a fair point to make, make servers <laughs> yes. uh, yeah. easy to use. Yep, absolutely. So, cool. Ingolf uh, Schaefer emailed us to say... To me, the situation in the Floss world is a bit like in The Muppet Show, where Waldorf and Statler comment on everything and make fun of everyone, and that's it. Sure, they're fun to watch, but it does not help uh, improve any stage of performance at all. Um, take Unity. There are tons of highly critical blog posts about why it should about it, but why should it be negative that there's another take on how to interact, interact with the desktop? It's always easier to criticise than to create. Some people remind me a bit of the Daleks in their attitude to the free software, uh, for, and that is, I can imagine them floating around shouting, the GPL is superior and exterminate proprietary software. Yes, I get that feeling sometimes as well. <laughs> yeah, I like those analogies though. Waldorf and Sattler and the Daleks in the same email is pretty yeah. good going. <laughs> Ricardo Lomero emailed us to emailed in to tell us about a cool sysadmin product. I was listening to the last show, and the impression I got here is there's no easy server alternative for home and non-geek users, but there are. Check Amahi, uh, which is at amahi.org. It provides a web interface with disk pooling, instant install of web apps, VPN access, file sharing, monitoring, etc. I'd never heard of this thing. No, no neither that sounds I. fun. And yeah. in the 15 seconds research I've just done... Um, <laughs> You've got a nice picture of the box. I have, yeah. <laughs> which I don't even think is real. I think it's a fake box. Right. Um, but it's got a nice pretty logo. Oh, it's worth having a look at that. Bright yeah. primary colours, which, you know, appeals to me. Um, we've also had another email, or voicemail, I should say, from the Wing Commander. A very disappointed Wing Commander, Sir Arthur Camudgeon here. Having listened to your last program, for heaven's sakes, if you're going to quote Latin, then get it right. Your chap should have said, quid quid Latin dictum sit altum videtur, which, as we all know, means anything said in Latin sounds profound. In Esperanto, sounds just the opposite. As for diligentia maximum etiam mediocris engini subsidium, you really should have known it means diligence is a great help even to a mediocre intelligence always stood me in good stead perhaps in future you should leave the latin to the professionals i've always been something 
of a cunning linguist myself, although not cunning enough to understand C++. More of a C- must try harder. But your item about the smartly dressed duck last time prompted me to try out some Chinese at my local takeaway restaurant. Not terribly successful, but the young man simply shouted at me, duck soup, and walked away. At least that's what I think he said. Yours, the WC. Okay. <laughs> Right, okay. Uh, yeah. Can we block his email? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we should try. <laughs> and that is all your feedback this time. And that's it for this episode. Thank you for listening. You can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, including voicemail numbers and Twitter feeds, Facebook and IRC channels. Let us know what you think of the show or give us your thoughts about Ubuntu and the community around it. And there'll be no live show next episode, sadly. Um, However, there will be a podcast download as normal on Wednesday the 6th of July. Mm. Just no live show. So please don't don't wait for it to start <laughs> yeah i bet people do though we should change the website we yeah. should um block access to the irc channel <laughs> <laughs> that's just mean <laughs> well, yeah. have you enjoyed yourself alan who is an alan pope i, I have very much enjoyed Yay. myself thank you very thank much you for bringing for cake yes, yes and thank you for coming geek cake mm. it was the geekiest uh, cake that, that, that the supermarket could provide <laughs> good stuff <laughs> and we'll see you next time Bye-bye. bye bye bye